Good morning, folks. Uh, 2017 Advanced Higher Chemistry Multiple Choice Walkthrough. Don't forget to watch this using Firefox and ad blockers and get rid of these annoying adverts on YouTube. Right, let's start, because we're up against the time today. All noble gases, outermost orbital. Outermost orbital in, orbital in a noble gas is a group uh, 8 or group 0 element, and these are P orbitals. You're filling the P block as you go along. It's P6 for all of them. Number 2, the electronic configuration of an atom in its ground state. By the way, as usual, I'm doing this. This is my acoustic version where I do have the answers, but I haven't seen them yet, so let's see how many mistakes I make. 2 is my traditional. I'm going to bet on 2 mistakes today. It's an atom, and it's in its ground state, so I would just count the electrons up. 2, 4, 10, 12, 18, uh, 19, and uh, 21, which is scandium. Yep, there we go, scandium. Number three, which line, get it on the screen, hey? Which line on the table should represent the four quantum numbers of an outer electron in a magnesium ion? So, magnesium 2 plus ion. So, that's 1s2, 2s2, um, 2p6. That's the magnesium ion. So, we're talking P electrons. So, n is 2. Yep, so scratch that one. n is not 3. Um, L has got to be 1 if we're talking P electrons. So, we can scratch that one. There are S electrons. Um... Ah, of course, M can't be minus 2 if L is only 1, because M is negative L through to positive L. So that's our answer. Number four, coordination number of an outlast has never heard of it. It used to be in the course, by the way, um, but it was taken out. So this is problem solving. I really can't be bothered looking at this. This requires the radius from the data book. So this is a data book question. I'll come back to it at the end, because it's just a problem solving question. Read the data book. It's, I can't even remember what page it is. Ionic radii. Oh, goodness me. I'll come back to it at the end. Come back to question four. It's just a question of reading the data book, popping the numbers in, finding which one it matches with. Simple problem solving. Number five and six. What is the formula for diaquatetrachlorocobaltate 2? This is unusual. Normally it's the other way around. They ask you to name it. Well, the 2 means that the cobalt had a charge, an oxidation number, of 2 plus on it. And I see tetrachloros, so there's four chlorines, which are all one minus, and two aquas, so H2O, two. And does that help us? Oh yeah, we can chuck out that one straight away because it's got four waters, it's the wrong way around. Which just leaves us with a charge on this. Four minuses, two pluses, we mean a two minus charge, so it's going to be A. Which of the following indicators is most suitable to use in a titration of dilute hydrochloric acid with dilute ammonia? So, weak base, strong acid, that means the pH of the equivalence point, not the neutralization point, the pH of the equivalence point where you've just neutralized the acid is going to be below 7. So, we want an indicator that changes color 6-ish um, or 5-ish. Let me pause this, I'll find the page in the data book for us. Okay, so here's the indicator. Sorry, it's a multiple choice, you silly old fool. You've got the indicators, just match them up. Bromothymol blue, not bromophenol blue. Bromothymol blue, 6 to 7.6, .6. yeah, a bit high. Uh, phenolphthalein, 8.3, nope. Methyl orange, uh, that sounds promising. Phenol red, nah. Phenol red for the same reasons as it can't be bromothymol blue, actually, which is quite nice. That sort of eliminates that. It would both be suitable. So, methyl orange. I really should have done that problem solving when I had the data book. You're a lazy, lazy person, eh? Um, the pH of benzoic acid with a concentration of 0 0.01. Oh, this will teach me to be lazy. pH of a weak acid. Uh, the equation for pH of a weak acid, pH of weak acid is actually in your data book. It's in the equations page. Um, and it's a, oops, don't drop the data, but okay. It's a half pKa minus a half log C. Uh, I might simply, we know the C, that's the concentration. The pKa of benzoic acid, we can go and look it up and work it out. Excuse me, I'm going to do exactly that. However, there's no point in you watching me do it. 
Sorry, guys, there's the calculation there. So it's a half pKa, which is 4.2 for benzoic acid. Let me just check that. Benzoic, yes, it is. Minus a half log of 0 0.01. Uh, it comes out to be 3.1 for the pH. Number eight. A reaction must be exothermic. I hate words like that, because then this becomes almost a, like a logic puzzle. Must be exothermic if... Oh, I know what they're doing with this one. They're rearranging our Gibbs free energy equation. Delta G equals delta H minus T delta S. If you rearrange to solve for delta H, delta H equals delta G plus T delta S. And what they're saying is what conditions must be true if this ends up being negative? Because this is a positive here. So um, if you have delta G and delta S are both negative, and you could have a negative adding more negative. Yeah, that's always going to be negative, in fact. So I'm going to go initially with 8. Should I come back and check it? I'm going to go with 8 just now. If it was my exam, I would come back and eliminate all the others. But mathematically, that makes sense. Because if this is negative and you're adding more negative to it, you can only ever be negative for your answer. And of course, negative matches up with an exothermic reaction. Number 9. Doesn't fit on the page, now it does. For the reaction A plus B makes C, we got the following data. Oh, this is an unusual one. It's quite nice. They've rearranged things. Normally, they give you all the numbers here, and they ask you to establish the order. In this case, they're giving you the rate equation. It's K times B to the power of 2, so it's the second order with respect to B. And if we have a look at this, what have we got? Concentration of A is irrelevant. Concentration of B here, you had a reaction rate of 0 0.5. If you've doubled that, we need to double this to the power of 2, which in other words, times 4. So it's D. That because it's second order, because of that number there, by the way. That's why. At number 10, the rate equation for the reaction between nitrogen monoxide and chlorine is um, that. The units, oh my goodness. Uh, oh, I'm going to tell the SQA off here again. Uh, I don't know why I bother telling them off. Nobody's ever watching this from the SQA, but that's really sloppy. The, the 20, another paper where they made the massive assumption that you're measuring rate in a certain unit of moles per litre per second. That's not necessarily the case, but okay. It's algebra with units time. So rearrange the solve for K. K, and they're also assuming that these are measured moles per litre, which is more valid. But that's a big assumption for the, the time there. Um, rearrange for K. Stop ranting, hey. Rate over NO squared times concentration of Cl2 to the power of 1. So that's going to be moles per litre per second on the top line, and the bottom line, by the time you combine all of these together, you're going to get moles to the 3 and litres to the minus 3. I'm going to take them up to the top line, cancel them out where I can. There's no point in your That's the result. Uh, litres squared... Per mole squared per second, the world's least friendly units. Going to go with that one. Number 11. Which of the following describes the bonding in ethane? Ethane is sp3 hybridization, which means we can throw out that and that. Sigma bonds only, sigma and pi bonds. Oh, it's sigma bonds only. It's just B. That's remarkably easy. I haven't missed anything there, have I? No. No, no, no. That's fine. Number 12. Pyridine has the following structure. The number of sigma bonds in a molecule of pyridine is... Now, at first glance, you're inclined to just go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and of course 6 is there. But what you can easily forget is this is the skeletal notation. So there are H's on each of these points. There's not an H on there because the nitrogen has all three bonds used up. So in fact, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 is the slightly devious answer. Quite like that question. It's devious, but I like it. 
racemic mixture, straightforward KU definition. It's a pair of, no, it's not a pair of geometric isomers, nope. It's a pair of enantiomers mixed in equal proportions. So it's B. Equal concentrations of left and right hands. That's what a racemic mixture is. Uh, number four, I was about to make a joke there that I can sometimes make in the classroom, but I better not make it here. Number 14, the nucleophiles in these two reactions are. So nucleophiles are things that are attracted to a positive charge. They themselves are either negative or they have a non-bonded pair of electrons in a little happy alien head, like, for example, nitrogen does. So ammonia, and that is negative. So that is remarkably easy, that one. Again, am I missing anything? Don't think so. We'll find out at the end. Number 15. Compound X has a GFM of less than 100 grams. Complete combustion produces carbon dioxide and water only. Reduction of X produces a secondary alcohol. Oh, right, okay. That's the biggest clue right there. Because it means that X has to be a ketone. He says, uh, realising that three of them are ketones. So we've only eliminated that. Oh, Water only on combustion means you can't have chlorine because you produce a compound of chlorine, so that's scratched as well. All we need to do is work out the GFM. Less than 100. 612s are 72. I'm inclined to go with this one, but what I'll do is pause the video and do the maths. Yeah, thought so. Benzene ring tips over the 100 mark. Okay, making good progress. What's next? 16. Based on the information in the table, Based just on the table information, the tertiary amine has the highest boiling point. There's the highest boiling point. That is not tertiary amine because it's got two hydrogens on it. Secondary amine is... Uh, sorry, I forgot how to speak. The secondary amine has the lowest boiling point. That is not a secondary amine. That's a tertiary amine. So I'm going to chuck that one out too. The primary... This is famously where I make, where I make my mistakes on these sorts of questions, by the way. The primary amine has a lower boiling point than the tertiary Primary amine is this one. Since that's got the highest boiling point, I'm going to throw that one out as well. I hope this one's right, otherwise I've screwed it up. The secondary amine has a lower boiling point than the primary. Secondary amine has two alkyl groups. That's the secondary. And that is the primary. So, yeah, I'm going to go with D for that one. We'll find out at the end again. 17. Compound Y reacts with the product of its own oxidation to form an ester. So, Y, then you oxidize it produces something else, which then reacts with Y to form an ester. Now, esters are made from alcohols and carboxylic acids. So that means if you oxidize the alcohol, you can make a carboxylic... Yep, this has to be carboxylic acid, and this has to be an alcohol, which means we can throw that out and that out, which leaves us with propan one or propan 2 and of course primary alcohols are the ones that make carboxylic acids. Secondaries make ketones. So 17 is B. Which of the following statements about benzene is correct? The molecule is planar. Have I missed out a knot? I'm famous for missing out knots because I'm tempted to stop at A because that is true. Uh, and I would come back and check the rest. But since we're making good time today, benzene does not react with electrophiles. That's rubbish. It loves electrophiles. Re no, that's rubbish. It doesn't uh, react with nucleophiles. And no, all the bonds are equal lengths in the benzene. Uh, go and watch my video if you're not sure. Chlorine has two isotopes, 35 and 37. These isotopes are present in a sample of trichloroethane. The number of molecular ion peaks expected in the mass spectrum. So the molecular ion is just the GFN, because it's the whole thing. You have not any chunks off it yet, apart from a single electron. That's all you've taken off, which so doesn't change the GFM. Oh, because there's two different isotopes of chlorine. You can combine the isotopes, so these could all be 37, 37 and 37. That would give you one result. That could be 36, 36, sorry. That could be 35, which would give you a second result. That could be 35, which gives you a third result. And that could be 35 give you a fourth result. I'm going to go with four. See if I'm right later on. Is that right? So all 37, all 35, 135 and 237s, 235s. Yeah, 
Four. I think so. Fairly confident in that one. He says, famous last words, how hard can it be? The following substance was analysed using infrared spectroscopy. Spectrum produced would not have a significant peak. Uh, spectroscopy, infrared, here we go. Right, again, don't miss your knot here, hey. 1700 to 1680. That's aromatic CO stretch. Oh, I think we've hit the answer. Because this is not an aromatic molecule. But let's just check the rest. 2962 to 2080. That's alkane CH stretch. That definitely would have. 3100 um, to 3000. That's benzene. Oh dear. Benzene ring. Hmm. That's definitely benzene ring, according to. Oh, wait a minute, sorry. 1700, 1680 in the data book here. Read the fucking data book here, hey. It says aromatic and alkyl ketones. Missed the and. That's wicked. So it's the CO stretch, so yeah, it would have that. And 35, definitely check all the numbers here, hey. 35 to 3300, that is the amine H. So yes, that would definitely have that. So I'm going to go with C as my corrected answer there. 21. Binding to DNA to block the synthesis of some proteins. Um, binding to DNA. So the receptor... I'm famous for getting the medicinal questions wrong. I'm going to blame the fact I haven't taught it for a few years. That's my excuse anyway. If it blocks the synthesis of some, some proteins, then it is an antagonist. So I'm going to go with A or B. And what is the receptor? The receptor is the molecule to which the drug connects or binds onto. So I'm going to go with A. We'll find out if I'm right. 22. Which of the following would be suitable as a reagent in the gravimetric analysis of silver ions? How are you supposed to know? Because it's got to be something which will precipitate the silver as a solid. So we need to find the page of the data book that's got solubilities. Thought I'd try and save you from horrible paper rustling noises there. Silver. Silver night. Right, okay. So, what are the options? Sodium nitrate. Well, that would be useless because silver nitrate is soluble. So scratch that. Potassium sulfate. Silver sulfate. Not one you see very often. According to... Sorry, get it on the page. Silver nitrate is, so, is very soluble. Silver sulfate is soluble. Silver carbonate. I would imagine would be insoluble. Yes, it is. And silver chloride is also insoluble. Aha! We have apparently two correct answers to this. We have two different salts of silver, which are both soluble. The carbonate and the chloride. Which means we need to look at... I know how this works out. Just realised it. We need to look at the other reactants, which is the barium carbonate and the ammonium chloride. See, for precipitation, you need to add a, two solutions together. And I bet one of these is insoluble. I'm going to go with barium carbonate being insoluble. Let's have a look. Barium carbonate, insoluble. I thank you. And the answer there is ammonium chloride. 23. Using colorimetry, the most appropriate filter for determining the concentration of green nickel ions would be... Well, we need the colour wheel for this. Because if we have a look at green, we need the opposite end here. So, um, what we got? 390, yeah, that sounds feasible. 490, nope, definitely not. 540, no. And 680, nope, I'm going to go with A. Counterintuitive, that. Um, you think it should be the green colour, but it's not, of course. You're seeing green because other colours are being blocked. Go and watch my video on absorption spectroscopy. It does twist the old melon a bit. 24. Are we on screen, hey? Yes, we are, more or less. Thin layer, chromato thin layer chromatogram for a mixture of amino acids. Which amino acid has an RF value of approximately 0 0.75? Oh, come on, SQA. 
Uh, okay, fine. So the RF value is defined as the fraction, how far up the dot goes in comparison to the solvent front. And the solvent front has gone up to 8. So we want 0.75 of 8. The quarters of 8 is 6. So there is your 0.75. So I'm going to go with Q. I take back my complaint with the SQ. I didn't actually notice that they had put a ruler. I was going to say, are we supposed to be guessing? No, shut up, hey. 25. The properties of the most soluble solvent to extract caffeine from an aqueous solution of tea. Thank goodness for that. I thought that we were about to see some blasphemy in the form of uh, removing caffeine from coffee there, but I'll let them off. You want... So, caffeine is more soluble in the solvent than it is in the tea solution. Absolutely. So I take it there's two where it's got less soluble. Yeah, so we can scratch these two. So you want the caffeine to be going into the solvent and leaving the tea behind. And you want the solvent, obviously, not to be miscible, uh, mixable, same thing, with the tea solution. So you can separate the two of them out in a nice separating funnel. So you get a nice clear layer forming there between the two phases. So that is A. That was easier than it looked. 26. A series of titrations was performed to determine the concentration of vitamin C, blah, 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 blah. Which of the following would be a suitable control experiment? Quite a lot of practical knowledge in this paper. I'm glad I made that practical video. If you haven't seen it yet, by the way, you might want to go and have a look. It just brushes up on all these techniques. A control experiment for this. Well, if you're looking for vitamin C, you would need to make up a solution of vitamin C that you had taken off the shelf of the chemistry cupboard. So definitely not titrating more of that. Titrate a solution of pure vitamin C of no concentration. I'm going to go with that one. Let's check the rest. More, no. No, 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 because the fruit juice is... You can't guarantee how much is in the fruit juice. That's why it's not that one either. And no, diff, no, it's B. You make up the solution yourself, go and do the titration. That's the control. 50 centimetres cubed of 0.1 molar sodium barium hydroxide, no sodium hydroxide, was added to 50 centimetres cubed of 0 0.01 molar sodium sulphate. Excuse me, I do apologise. Sorry, um, so it's just one to one, isn't it? One to one. So you've got 0 0.01 times 0 0.05 which is 0 0.0005 moles of each. Because according... The reason I'm chewing this over is... Is it not just a very straightforward... The answer is twice as many moles as either of these. Oh, but it's not moles. Ah, it's concentration. And we've got two solutions of 50 centimetres cubed added together. Aha! Nearly caught me there, guys. I got nearly caught out by that. That's the number of moles, okay. Um, let me just check that. There's too many zeros here to be keeping track of in my head. This time of the course. Uh, yep. So multiply that by 2. You get that number of moles. And then divide that by 0.1. And you get 0.01. The answer is B. Not 0 0.001, which is the tempting first answer. There, yes, there were 30 multiple choice questions in this year, in 2017. They have been jiggling around with a number of multiple choice questions over the years recently, and this was thought to be more of them. This has faded out of fashion for more written instead. 28. 1.06 moles of phenylamine reacts with 5.6 grams of bromine, which shows the correct stoichiometry. Oh, so we're going to turn that into a mass. No, 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 sorry. That's a moles. Got to turn that into moles and then find out which one matches. Okay, there's no point in watching me do this. Okay, there's the moles, guys, and they're in the ratio of one to three. So one of phenylamine to three of bromine. So I just turned 5.16 into a number of moles. It's an unusual one. I had to go and look up bromine's GFM, 79.9. 29 ibuprofen, structural formula there. If one tablet contains 300 milligrams, so 0 0.3 grams, of ibuprofen, approximately how many tablets can be manufactured from one mole of... That's like a maths question. Oh, it's giving me a headache just thinking about it. 
formula. Ah, jeez. Right, they're checking, by the way, don't forget, skeletal formula. So there's H's on there. Don't use C6H6 for the bromine ring. For the bromine ring? Hello? Got bromine on the brain. Benzene ring. So this is going to be... I'm going to work out the total molecular formula of this. Okay, so the GFM was 205, um, and there's 0.3 grams in each tablet. So 205 divided by 0.3 gives us 683, which, just to make life that little bit more awkward, is they have put it in scientific notation. <laughs> oh, 683 doesn't match up with any of these. Have I done my GFM wrong? Ha, I can't count mages. It's H18, which gives you 206, which means it's 687. So the answer is B. I would the last question, blimey. And then it's time for marking. Let's see if I've, how well I've failed. The term accuracy is used to describe how close an experimental result is to the theoretical value, and the precision describes how close numbers are to each other. Instead, percentage of our mass of chlorine in this, uh, both accurate and precise. Okay, so we need the answer. Percentage mass of chlorine in this lot here. So we're going to need a barium. Barium is... Barium's not one I know very well. 137.3 plus two lots of chlorine, which is 71, isn't it? Yeah. Plus uh, two lots of water, which is 2 times 18, which is 36. Uh, and then we're only interested in the chlorine. Yep, so 71 on the top line times 100. Let me see that answer. So 29.06% by mass. So it's not these ones, that's for sure. They are not accurate. Uh, these ones are accurate, but if you have a look, then this one varies by quite a chunk. It varies by 0.9 of a percent there. Sorry, more than, uh, more than that. Yeah, so that's not precise, whereas these only vary by 0.1%, so that's your lot. Right, marking time. Uh, if I haven't made any mistakes, which is highly unlikely, I'll say bye-bye at that. If I have made some errors, then we'll find out in just the click of a pause button. Thanks for listening. Bye-bye. <laughs> just remembered. Hadn't done number four, had I? Uh, radius ratio. I know radio I selected. It's page 18. You can hear the sign in my voice there. Okay. Zinc sulfide. So, uh, this, by the way, is, this is page, um, I haven't really selected ions, which is page 18, which you'll never ever use again. So that's why they're just making use of old content. This used to have to be memorized. Zinc 2 is 74, and sulfide is, where's my sulfur? There is 184. So, 74 over 184 comes out to be 0 0.4 radius ratio, which falls into this category, so the answer must be B. By the way, so far I have not made a single mistake, which is not like me. I must not be feeling well. Number three, uh, C, number two is B, and number... Oh, <laughs> oh so close. The very first question. Because of helium, of course. Poor old helium is filling an S orbital, so therefore the answer is D. Uh, let's do a face reveal since I'm here. Ta da! Oh! Saved by the bell, literally. Thanks for listening, folks. Bye bye.